they grow up and then their opinions start to form the mainstream of discourse. So people yes. are just like, oh, okay, everybody likes this thing now when it's really just the people who grew up with the thing as a child now yeah. can be like, this thing was always great. And well, you know what, Max? That's pretty similar to our movie today, wouldn't you say? How so? Well, Max, this is a movie about a song and dance man who is Fred Astaire and has a flat butt. And he's jumping on the bandwagon with everybody else <laughs> about good yes. things. And jumping on the bandwagon and listening to the Spectator Film Podcast. Like everybody does. Yes, the most popular podcast on the internet. Everybody who's anybody listens to the Spectator Film Podcast with me, Max. Yeah, and me, Austin. And uh, no third people. But there is the third thing of the movie we're doing today, uh, The Bandwagon from 1953, which was Austin's pick. So, Austin, you take us into this. Well, um, I don't know why I picked this. Wow, compelling answer, Austin. Thanks. I, uh, we, Audience, you excited? We did a musical sort of last week. But no, um, I've been wanting to do like a classic musical for a long time. And you have as well. Yes. On the show. I am a slut for musicals. Yeah, that's that what up, you put always on say. You have a shirt that says that. Yeah. The one of those Twitter bots got you. They're like, <laughs> I want a t-shirt that says I'm a slut for musicals. And then they posted a link and created one. And then you're like, you stole my idea. You bastard. <laughs> so I linked to a picture of baby Yoda. <laughs> now that Twitter bot, it still exists. Just, just under a different name. It but. got fucked up and it said that baby Yoda is a slut for musicals. <laughs> But yeah, so um, so we chose, that's how we chose this. And uh, this is, a, we've done musicals before on the show, but it's been a different sort of thing. It's been more recent things. And I think the similarity between both. More modern, more refined. Oh yeah, like a fine wine. M musical. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Repo the genetic opera. Just peak, peak of musical ingenuity and in filmmaking. Uh, you can shit on that movie all you want, but I'll never, <laughs> I'll never stop Austin. That movie is shitting on itself. I don't have to do a goddamn thing, but yeah. So both that movie, that thing and uh, nightmare before Christmas are, I think trending in a different direction than the classical Hollywood musical of the fifties, because they seem more to be focused on, they almost seem more closer to like those visual albums that artists release now, stuff like Dirty Machine from Janelle Monet, right? Where there's Big a fan, by the way. Yeah. And that, that I, well, I, I guess you'd call that a movie. Dirty Machine is cool. Yeah. And, um, Janelle Monet is cool. Shout out to Janelle Monet. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't she in a movie recently, actually? Or no, she's in a movie that's like upcoming, right? Probably. About like the, like Antebellum South or something. I can't remember. Um, but anyway. Both of those seem to be trending in a direction, even though there's a lot of like recognizable elements from older musical in them where they're very focused on the music. And I think especially with Nightmare Before Christmas, we hypothesized in that episode that the auteur behind it was really Danny Elfman. Right. And he's sort of controlling certain things about the movie. Well, I, I think it was more just like Henry Sel uh, Selleck had a very clear vision for what he wanted to to like aesthetically look like. Yeah. But like because of that, the plot is mainly there to transport us between physical set pieces and musical set pieces. Yeah. But it seems like that movie is in service to music Yeah, in a way that is um, trending towards that being like the final destination more. And uh, that's an interesting way to take it, but it's not what I would say is like a classical musical. And uh, the reason why I chose this one in particular is I'm, I mean, I'm not really sure <laughs> Why this one? But I saw it for the first time recently earlier this year. I don't have a long relationship with it, but I enjoyed it, even though I don't think it's the best. And the director, Vincent Minnelli, is a director that I really enjoy. And um, I think he's somebody who's a very key cog in that sort of MGM 50s musical, along with like Stanley Donan and Charles Walters. And maybe we'll do some of their movies as well soon, too. But I, I just think it's a very solid starting off point. However... I do want to like preface our commentary track and discussion of this movie this week by saying that this movie is full of references and allusions to other things in Hollywood and, and our creative people, whether they're like choreographers or directors or whatever. And um, we may not have access to a lot of that intertextuality, which I now after preparing for the movie for an entire week, I feel like that's what's most interesting to me about this. Um, but I also feel least prepared to discuss that part of it. So we are probably going to miss a lot of that. However, I think we're still going to be able to point out some of it when it pops up. And I think this is a movie that is still going to be worth revisiting, even if I don't think it's like the most amazing musical. And um, 
Okay. Yeah, I think that's pretty much my opinion. Well, if you're still with us, um, so my history of this movie is even less substantial than Austin's. Um, I had never seen this movie. I was very familiar with the sort of most famous song from this musical, That's Entertainment, Mm -hmm. from various references that made me look up the song but never bothered to see what movie it was from. So I started watching this movie. I'm like, oh, oh, okay, cool. That's this movie. And I enjoyed it. I was more in the mood to do a musical than I normally am, which is almost always, but because uh, obvious motion picture winner of the year, Cats, just came out. Right. So I'm in a very musical mood. It won. Yes, it already won. It um, won. Preemptively, the Academy is just like, Fuck, man, nothing's going to beat this. So they just gave it every award. Um, but they renamed the Oscars. Just cats. <laughs> the cat. Andrew Lloyd Webber presents. It'd be more fun to get a golden cat statuette than like, I mean, who the fuck is Oscar? He was, uh, I mean, do you want to know the actual story behind that? No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> cats. It's interesting. <laughs> that you decided to shit on repo genetic opera. Oh, during your summary of this, because in addition to being wrong, okay. Yes. The uh, theme that we both noticed in this movie is the fact that the movie's general uh, sort of thesis statement is there's no such thing as high art and trash. Everything is entertainment and enjoyable. So the fact that you're holding this movie on a pedestal above repo genetic opera is antithetical to the very point of the movie itself. I disagree with that. In fact, I'd say that this movie, if it were a person, would say that Repo the Genetic Opera sucks ass. No, I think they'd just I think be like, would. I think they would be like, no, nah, it's that's that checks all the boxes. We're I think that, a that dollars. it would say that that long haired man <laughs> from the Grave Digger Man thinks he's Oedipus. <laughs> I mean, that's besides the point. He should go throw himself off a cliff or something. <laughs> but. No, I, I mean, I do disagree with that opinion, but um, it is interesting that this movie does interrogate that stuff. That's probably what keeps me from ultimately really thinking it's like the most amazing thing is that I find some of its subtext confusing. And also, I think the set pieces and songs are the strongest part, and uh, it's just sometimes feels a little bit long to sit through after watching it several times in one week. Yeah, but from what I understand, you said that there are some people who think that this is better than like singing in the rain. According to Letterboxd. There are a number of people who think this is superior to singing in the rain, and uh, I don't understand. Yeah, no, I I, I don't <laughs> agree with that at all. It's, I mean, at the very least, you and I have discussed Gene Kelly's ass supremacy yes. in the MGM musical scene. Supremacy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get that as, as like a tattoo on his left cheek. Hashtag supremacy. Yeah, there you go. But I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> So, you know, uh, Singing in the Rain is one of the few movies I can watch with a smile from ear to ear the entire way through. But yeah. um, it's just a generally enjoyable movie. I didn't have quite that experience with this movie. It's fun, though. No, it's it, fun. It's good. Yeah. And not to like kind of fall in with everybody else, but I think it's an incredibly solid musical. So I'll be more than happy to hop on that bandwagon. Yeah. And Vincent Minnelli has made a ton of good movies. And I wouldn't say this is his best movie, fortunately. So there's still room to go up. And I think I really do enjoy meet me in St. Louis and, uh, the bad and the beautiful specifically quite a bit. And, uh, those are definitely movies we could do on the show. So yeah, I don't really have as much to say. We're going to have a ton of essays I can reference during this, this oh movie. Boy. As well. So yeah, we're just going to have a fun conversation about all sorts of musicals. Kind of like the movie itself, Max, kind of like the movie itself. Are you ready to jump in? I hope our audience is because Whatever you're getting, I'm not sure if it's going to be entertainment. Whoa, look out. (laughs) Roar. Roar. Uh, I miss this real lion. The what? What now? The real lion. Oh, the real lion. Yes. I thought you said Rio lion. Yes. (laughs) It's confused. So this is the first reference of the movie. We have the uh, top hat and cane, of course, belonging to Fred Astaire. Uh, and this is reference to the uh, credit sequence of his hit movie, Top Hat, which came out just about 20 years prior to this one. Back in the roaring 30s. 
Yeah, I mean, it was a big time for musicals then, too. Uh, the thing with Fred Astaire in this, uh, as you can tell, and is it like a big... Betty Comden and Adolph Green, by the way, I'll just interrupt myself, also wrote the screenplay for Singing in the Rain, I believe. Uh, wonderful film. But, so, the fun thing about this is that I believe in the original theater stage production of Bandwagon, whatever that was, um, I think it was in, like, 1931, uh, Fred Astaire was in that too. And that was like one of his first big starring performances. And I think they also make reference reference to that when they're out on 42nd street. And he's talking about that too. Right. And he's referencing different theaters. And he's like, I had a big hit there once. I think he's referring specifically to him being in top at in the thirties. That's the level of like, that's something that like literacy of this movie has. That's something you don't really see that often though. You'll see it kind of in Disney things where like they'll pluck people off of Broadway to put in their movies. Like, uh, it was much more common in the past. Yeah. But like when you were adopting a Broadway musical in the past, in the fifties, like a lot of times you would just get the actor who was famous. That not even musicals. Yeah. Look at Bella Lugosi. Yeah. That's what happened with him. But yeah. So I think this movie is very film literate and I, unfortunately I don't think we're going to be equipped properly with our one week of like several days of preparation to really dive through all those references. But it is something that's going to be worthwhile in terms of like, if people revisit this movie to sort of dig through, because I think it can inform uh, some really intelligent insights into the subtext and everything. And of course uh, we, this I think is a notable way to introduce his lack of like cultural relevancy now, because this is like an art auction, uh, like auction or something. Or not like an art auction, but it's like, it's the same setting. You yeah. know what I mean? So there's like a type of cultural value. And unfortunately, I think this is also the beginning of like the way this movie confuses its subtext <laughs> or in a way that makes it feel kind of like bizarre and off-putting to me where it's like this movie is trying to set up this thing where it's like, okay, we have the uh, entertainment versus art dichotomy. That's what we should call it, Right. And we can maybe compare it to like a previous movie we've done, Sherlock Jr., where that has like the vaudeville versus narrative dichotomy. And I think those two things kind of line line up for comparison pretty just well. A, just a real quick thing, not to interrupt you too much, but I remember uh, when I was watching this this week for the first time, I was yeah. confused because I just because all these old white men look the same. I thought it was a mirror behind them. And I'm like, Oh, that's a cool thing they're doing in the camera where you can see the guy who's behind the menu and the can. Oh wait, that's just a window. And they all look the same. Wait, you thought it was a mirror. Yeah, I thought it was a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> anyway, I mean, th- yeah, I don't know what to say about that. It was just a quick thing before I realized that that guy's wearing a purple suit and that guy's not. But anyway, Oh, you mean behind them on the side? Yeah. Okay. No, not the back. <laughs> I thought you meant like the window. No. Well, yeah, the window on the side. I thought that train car was just like... Yeah, a- yeah. Honestly, that wood paneling is disgusting beyond description. That's the most repulsive thing I've ever seen in a train. Yeah, remember when we made trains out of wood in the good old days? <laughs> you know what, though? I do love that line. I'm going to start using that whenever people say something that's like irritating to me. I'm like, here's this exploding cigar. That's what the CIA tried to do to Castro, and it didn't really work out well for them. So. <laughs> That's what they tried to do to us. I mean, come on now. But yeah, so um, I uh, again, just going off the comparison of Sherlock Jr., I do think a lot of the same elements in that movie, which I think that movie is a little bit more intelligent in terms of how it sets that up, of the vaudeville versus narrative, it is present in the dichotomy of entertainment versus art, where this movie ver- views entertainment as being like perceived low cultural value, but also non-narrative more so. I think it participates more in what we often bring up, or what I often bring up, the cinema of attractions. Am I right? Yeah. And uh, hearkening back to an earlier day of the cinema and musicals. And that's why it turns into more of like a review, like a straight-up review musical later on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh. And I also think there's some interesting stuff here. You could probably read into like the, the like placement of technology as something that is like mobile and like allows for, um, 
I don't know, spectacle to be like produced on demand. Cause I think this movie places a very high value on spontaneity as do a lot of backstage musicals, but this one especially is big on spontaneity and a lack of codes and, uh, and um, like restrictions. And we just have to go out of our way to point out the amazing Ava Gardner uh, making a little cameo. But I do think it's interesting that she's mentioned by those other people on the train car beforehand, and then magically she appears for us, doesn't she? Kind of, yeah. And I feel like this movie is so self-aware that I think, as something we've talked about a little bit in the past, the combination or the conflation of like train technology with film technology is something that I think you can really read into. And just, it's a movie, right? So Ava Gardner can appear on demand. But also there's something about that that I think the movie thinks is like a degradation of what a musical is, which I don't necessarily agree with. Um, But I think the movie sees it as being something where it's like, oh, people just don't value real entertainment anymore. But at the same time, that's also the thing that's going to make the show a hit. I mean, I don't know. It's a little confusing. It's, it is a mixed message that this movie ends up having. Yeah. Cause it's just like, you don't need to appeal to a sense of like high art to a degree to make something successful. But like, also it's like, that's because people don't appreciate good art or good entertainment anymore. Like, I, I don't know. It's basically saying like, whatever we make is good. <laughs> so don't question. Yeah. That's the weird thing is like, it also kind of just lumps everything that is not like the review non-narrative spectacle musical that doesn't take itself seriously. Everything else in its eyes is kind of like lumped together. And also like my assumption is not that like the avant-garde like Oedipus Rex thing (laughs) is going to make money. Why would I assume that's going to make money? Why, like in what world does like our idea of high art and, um, commercially successful overlap all the time, you know? Yeah. Oh, this is cute. Yeah. There's lots of things about this movie that are very cute and fun. I was more taken aback by how little Grand Central Station has changed. Well, this is definitely not Grand Central. This is a set or something. They even have a carpet. Or no, I'm sorry. They have a... uh, a, a uh, giant, like, did you see the, like, 20th Century Fox or whatever? It looked like it said, like, rug. I know this is made by MGM, but I saw 20th Century on, in the middle of this train platform when he was walking. I noticed that the other day, and I'm like, wow, that's nice. <sighs> did they just throw out that shit? Yeah. Are you fucking <laughs> serious right now? Wow. Oh, my fucking word. They just threw out all that shit. They made their signs and they got like jingle bells and they just threw it in the trash. Also, this is a very inaccurate uh, portrayal of standing in the middle of Grand Central Station because if you stand in the middle of the walking space, people will just walk through you. They do not care. Well, also like they're in the right for doing that. I'd walk into these people for throwing out their jingle (laughs) bells. I'd take their jingle bells and say like, you don't want it? Fine. And then just walk away. (laughs) That's a real shot. That's not a set. Yeah. Except you're going to tell me, it's like, actually, that was a revolutionary film technique where they had to... uh, They cut it all out of paper. (laughs) But no. I mean, this is just big old studio movie, right? So almost, like, I'm going to say there's no real anything, as far as I know. Not that that's bad. It's just a specific type type of musical. And Vincent Minnelli made a ton of them. And he made a ton of great movies. Uh, and I think his like later melodramas have often been um, considered to be not nearly as good as his earlier movies. But some of those are interesting, too. He's an interesting filmmaker and somebody that a lot of people debate his like auteur status. Um, it, because whether or not he's an auteur, a lot of people would talk about him. I think the famous thing was like um, the one of the major first wave of auteur critics, Andrew Saris has this famous quote about him where he described Minnelli as somebody who was the, the like Zenith of like the Hollywood stylist, but not, not tour. Yeah. Um, somebody he would say he's like too in love with beauty or something, 
was the quote or something and not that he doesn't care about like a subtext or anything. But I don't think that's necessarily true. There's a subtext running through a lot of Minnelli's movies, especially musicals um, about usually young creatives coming up in the world. And the plot of the musical is usually about them trying to achieve some sort of artistic fulfillment or gratification that also aligns with a romance plot and also aligns with just them integrating into society in a functional way because they're, they're, they have like bohemian tendencies, you know, where, where they will be like, at least in terms of how other people interact with them, they will be somebody who's late on the rent or whatever. They have a problem. They're not as successful as they want to be and they're chasing their dream. And the plot of the movie is them, finding a way to express themselves artistically and bring their inner vision to life while also consummating some romance plot. And that's something that happens a lot. And uh, there's a really good essay by Thomas L. Sasser, who um, uh, I think this essay is like a, one of the big like starting points for academic discussions of Vincent Minnelli. Um, and I'm going to quote it a lot in the show notes, but I think he gives a really good description of how these musicals from Vincent Minnelli work. So um, the first quote I want to read is this, the Minnelli musical thus transforms the movements of what one is tempted to call for lack of a better word, the soul of the characters into shape, color, gesture, and rhythm. It is precisely when joy or sorrow, bewilderment or enthusiasm, that is when emotional intensity becomes too strong to bear that a Gene Kelly or a Judy Garland has to dance and sing in order to give free play to the emotions that possess them. And I think that's a very good expression of the way these characters interact with space. And also I think another really good sort of longer quote to read just before we get too deep into the movie is this, thus defined the world of the musical becomes a kind of ideal image of the medium itself the infinitely variable material substance on which the very structure of desire and the imagination can imprint itself, freed from all physical necessity. The quickly changing decor, the transitions in the lighting and the colors of a scene, the freedom of composition, the shift from psychological realism to pure fantasy, from drama to surreal farce, the culmination of an action in a song, the change of movement into rhythmic dance. All this constitutes the very essence of the musical. In other words, it is the exaltation of the artifice as the vehicle of an authentic psychic and emotional reality. Minnelli's musicals introduce us to a liberated universe where the total freedom of expression of the character's creative impulse serves to give body and meaning to the artistic vitality of the director, both being united by their roles as matures and sen of the self. And that's a that lot. a lot of text. But the point of it is that character in this, there's a big difference between inner world and outer world, right? And the challenges these characters face is always something that is external to them existing in a material sense in the outer world. And when they start to work through their problems, what do they do? They interact with their setting or with objects in their setting and they express themselves through that object. They take the physical world, which is a like circumscribed limited thing and they imprint upon it their infinite inspiration and artistic and creative uh, sort of drive. Does that make sense? No, it does. I was first, I, I need the, those neon signs that say the gayest music box. The <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I didn't even notice that. Isn't it so weird? I wonder what happened with the change in etymology or just not etymology, but just the cultural sense of the word gay. I think the fact that that would I think be an it was just that thing. like, like everybody else in the 1950s, straight men were miserable so that we just inherently stopped trusting any man who seemed happy in public. So it just sort of morphed into that. I was like, Hey, he seems happy. It's like, he's following his heart and enjoying himself. Fuck him. He had to be miserable and yeah. fall in line. The rest of us. I also definitely think there's, there's a, there's this thing that goes on with today where I, I, this is a problem of all people, right? Where they look on the past and they're like, at any point in history, they were like, we've come so far since then. And they yes. just look down on everybody from the past. But I definitely think like culturally since even like a hundred years ago, I know masculine identity is, is really restrictive back then, but I also feel like it's become, it's like jettisoned certain other elements that, maybe in the past could have been viewed as part of being a man. Yeah. But now are more like 
you know, I don't know what how to describe it, like ghettoized into like different ideas of different identities. It's not even like ghettoized, but like masculinity today is so just like a lot of it's just fucking gross. Yeah, it's like what even is it? Just don't you can't wear anything that smells too fruity or too sweet. You can't <laughs> wear anything too excitingly colorful or if yeah. you do it has to be in the pre-approved salmon pink but i don't know any men that do that either yeah. i know that's not like a basis for that but like no like who the fuck even thinks that way a lot of people unfortunately but also there's like real quick before i forget i was wondering if like his sort of like enjoying this thing despite him like grumbling about it not being the theater where he got his first start earlier he was still having a good time. Like, is that like him inadvertently just falling into the plot of this movie? <laughs> like the second big musical number of just like, Oh, well, New York's not what I wanted it to be anymore. But by the way, that I'm gag still having fun, that gag with the ball, was that not planned? No, I mean, it was, uh, Oh, do you think he magically shot energy out? of his No, section? I'm saying like, and Scientology was born. Did they have like, I thought that you meant like they had it planned to fall and then the, like the prop guy hit something too quickly and he just sort of rolled with it and kept going. No. Okay. But this movie would love you to believe that everything is that spontaneous. Yeah. And I, of course that's the thing with musicals is like, they're also, if musicals are seen as like the, like Zenith of Hollywood filmmaking in terms of the production and the idea of creating entertainment that's broad, right. They are also like the biggest lie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it wants you to believe this is spontaneous but it's not this is actually the most choreographed and controlled form of filmmaking in classic hollywood on the contrary well you have to for musicals like that's yes. the thing yeah and yet all of them One are mistake and you have to do an entire fucking number again everybody back to positions everybody remember their steps like it, it's a fucking pain right but also like that is not what this movie wants you to think it's saying no 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 this movie is judging everything that is not Choreographed as we get from this hilarious transition to the Oedipus Rex show starring Jeffrey Cordova. Written and by directed, written by Jeffrey Cordova. Oh, yes. he's like Ed Wood. <laughs> this movie would have you think he's Ed Wood, even though this is apparently artistically like successful. Honestly, I want to watch this. But no, I, I think um, going back to what you're saying, I think it's uh, to answer your question, I think it's like he is finding in this penny arcade, the same idea of that cinema of attractions thing of like the carnival fairground that he really loved about the older musicals. Yeah. Right. A lot of which just starred him to begin with. We get a good look here at a uh, Joaquin Phoenix in early preparation for his Joker role with the makeup that he has on, but which guy, the guy <laughs> in the back, <laughs> look at him. He has the red around his lips, the blue around his eyes, the white face. You talking about the guy with the shadow on his face? Which one? <laughs> one in the middle. <laughs> oh, okay. Him. He looks like the Joker. Um, okay. It's pretty good. Thank you. No, I mean him. That joke was awful. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> uh. But yeah. So, um, oh my God. Wait a second. Are those pillars or cypresses? I was going to say that there's a reference later in this film to uh, Val Luton kind for some reason and the Isle of the Dead. Uh, and uh, is that also, is that set also for the Isle of the Dead? For some reason, Vincent Minnelli like thinks a lot about Val Luton and I don't know why. Because his other movie, The Bad and the Beautiful, is kind of based on both Val Luton and David O. Selznick. There's a character in that movie, the, the main character. And um, yeah. Huh, that's interesting. But yes, yeah, so um, going off of what we were talking about before in terms of spontaneity, and uh, I don't know what to describe it as. What's the opposite of spontaneity? Um, Pre-planned, yeah. restricted. But the idea of something being like strict and limiting. Perhaps you might say like ballet where there is no improvisation whatsoever. Ballet is like the most formally rigorous form of dance, even perhaps. I don't know anything about dance, but I would suppose that it probably is, right? It's I all guess, about yeah. it's all about creating something that's like the utmost of elegance and like fragility almost. <laughs> don't keep it a secret. I'm in the show. The written, directed by <laughs> starring five names on the billboard. 
He dresses like the guy from Blue's Clues. At least here. <laughs> you, he's nowhere near as good as any of the people from Blue's Clues. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Or are you fucking with me? I'm 100% serious. Okay, you're fucking with me. No. But yeah, so um, going off of that, I think... Ugh, that transition always weirded me out. But I didn't even notice that before. The yeah. weird artificial slow motion. But I think um, that's something you can really focus on in this conversation and the following musical number, that's entertainment as well. Where if you look at uh, the dialogue, I think it tells a different story than the actual visuals and the movement of the characters because something you were talking about too is how much you agree with what this jeffrey cordoba character is about to say that launches the the, the, that's entertainment yeah sort of song is that he's talking about how they're like boundaries between high and low are, are arbitrary and that also extending that to the way we enjoy these things he's saying there is no reason somebody who doesn't care about opera or whatever can't find a way to enjoy opera because opera can appeal to anybody or Shakespeare or anything. Right. And he's saying there's no reason some hoity toity person shouldn't be able to enjoy the penny car arcade. Exactly. Ostensibly. And that's something that I think both you and I agree with, but also that's not what the visuals say. And we're going to see it as they're dancing here. And this is also something that I agree with the both ways sentiment. It's just yeah. like people who, critique things for a living are allowed to like garbage and people who normally just sort of like go to movies for entertainment purposes if they give it a chance can find something in quote unquote high art yeah it's this movie's dismissal of high art toward the end of it that kind of leaves a sour taste in my mouth as i would say to, even here it's yeah. in there because we're gonna agree with everything they're saying but also it's gonna it's going to do two things that I think make it a little bit more complicated and make it seem a little bit like dismissive is the idea of one having this story where you have Faust, but also as like a Mickey Splane crime writer. Yeah. And it, they, it is Mickey Splane specifically who I, have you ever read any of his books? I know you're not as big into like noir hard boiled stuff as I am. No. Mickey Splane is like the one who's like, he makes me laugh because he writes the most like hard boiled manly men, men, and uh, like, I just always remember this one quote. I can't even remember what book it was about like this one scene where the narrator is talking about how he's like, I saw a communist, so I shot him. And he's like talking about how he's like, he took this communist and he's like, he's like, you're going to die now. You're going to die. And then he just blows his head off. And it's hilarious. Not intentionally though, but that's who Mickey Splane is. So even in choosing him, it's kind of like, taking a dig at that type of thing. But then it's also combining it with the high art thing of like Faust. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. is anyone saying that that is high art? Also is Faust selling a lot of money? <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't think those two things are the same. <laughs> but also the soul, the soul of the devil, obviously, but also, we know for a fact, Max, that's probably the real thing about why we totally disagree with this movie's opinion on this guy's idea, because we know for a fact that it works. Am I right? Faust is a musical. Phantom of the Paradise. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> now that's entertainment. I was thinking of the Faust superhero movie. Oh. <laughs> like, I don't remember the musical numbers in that besides the blaring metal in every scene. The Brian Usna Faust. No. Down with the sickness, Faust. <laughs> I'm getting you an electric shock collar and every time. <laughs> I got to find something else to make fun of. <laughs> oh, you'll find something. I, I know you will. But I got to find something that I really is just like, there you go. There you're, you go. You're a bit late on down with the sickness. That's kind of been a joke for That's quite a while. That's evergreen. It's evergreen. It'll never stop being a joke. No, you'll just be a dad someday and you'll just be like, hey, kids. kids. you remember down with the sickness? <laughs> and they'll like, be like, no. Dad, fuck you. And I'll be like, mission accomplished. But you bringing it up all the time just keeps refreshing it in the popular memory. No. No <laughs> one listens to this. Are you kidding me? Not with that attitude. They don't. Evil personified. This guy. Oh, my God. 
I think I read something that he's like, no, he's not based on Jose Ferrer. That doesn't make sense to me. I think I read something that said something like that though. But like, also he seems sort of like a joke Orson Welles type of guy. Yeah. I'm directing and starring and, and producing and, and cleaning the floors at night of my show. <laughs> but honestly, this seems like fun. You know, why can't this be successful? Because it's, I don't know. Too Other than the movie, too many saying, cooks in the kitchen where we have this one guy have an idea and then his friends start being like, oh, well, they have the, you can do this thing. And then you have one guy who wasn't really yeah. paying attention being like, oh, it's this. But that also doesn't seem to be the problem either. Because as we'll see during this, this song and dance sequence, that it seems like they really get on board with the same thing. It just seems like the movie is like, nope, doesn't work. And it doesn't give reasons why, you know, other than to suggest that, well, it's just inherently wrong to do that. <laughs> But also, um, that's an interesting thing to bring up, and that's part of the whole conversation about whether or not Vincent Minnelli is actually an auteur. Because one of the cool things about musicals being such a sophisticated form of this classical Hollywood movie is how many people need to be involved to actually make that work, you know? Yeah. And um, it's sort of like the idea of crediting like a choreography director compared to like a director of a movie. You know, like, how, like, okay, if you see a Gene Kelly musical, are you going to call that a Gene Kelly movie? Or are you going to call that like a Stanley Donan movie? This is kind of an arbitrary, not important question. But in terms of like auteur criticism, it would mean something, right? So how are these two people that are in charge of a certain thing in this movie actually bringing it to light? And this movie, oh my God, he's about to fall off the stage like Kelsey Grammer. I love that video so much. <laughs> but, um... One thing that I think is also kind of popular or not popular, but just celebrated in musical culture is like the idea of people who have their hand in everything in terms of a show, people who are going to be involved in a lot of different parts of the production, which uh, sometimes never goes well. But I mean, I, d I don't know enough about like musicals on the stage to really like have too many opinions beyond that. I mean, I like making fun of Andrew Lloyd Webber, but like he's, guys, he's a stuffy old British guy. Yes, but he's made a shit ton of money. <laughs> he has <laughs> made a ton of money. I can't really argue with him having a finger in every pot in terms of the productions. Well, people would just let him, right? Yeah. But also like that's something that you have to negotiate with these movies too. And, you know, is it, it okay, like, is okay. Vincent Minnelli the auteur of this, or is it the producers? He made a ton of movies with Arthur, Arthur Freed, um, and then some with John Hausman as well. And, uh, you know, maybe you could argue that those movies are different from one another. Maybe Arthur Freed is more in charge of how things are going. But then Vincent Minnelli also has all these different narrative things going on. And then the writers, too, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of different layers. And with a musical, it seems like it has to it's be... like onions. One of them does one of them say that later? No. In this movie? If only. <laughs> Could trace the origins of Shrek. Okay, but look at this dancing. Does that look coherent to you? I mean, it's like it, stepping I, on each other's shoes. I took it as a gag of them like all trying to jostle for like front position. But, but it does if you take what Thomas L. Sasser says in his essay, which I do, to be something that's like a fundamental part of these Minnelli musicals, it makes sense when you have the resolution of all these character things at the end of the movie, it is going to be something where it's like, that's going to be demonstrated visually in terms of how these characters are now moving and interacting with different parts of their environment. And it's pleasant and it's present in all this stuff where they're always running into each other. These hats don't fit their heads. Right. Yeah. Although I do love that gag of the guy who's carrying both ends of the ladder. <laughs> that's really funny. No, this whole musical number is delightful. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, too. Like, every set piece in that, in this movie, is like, it's great. And that's part of what Vincent Minnelli was really good at doing, right? And I think that's something that's I notice about a lot of different musicals is, like, I remember certain numbers, sometimes more so than the movies. Yeah. So, so again, that's another argument is, like, you know, like, which person is going to be in the lead, in terms of creative agency within any given movie. And that's something this movie is concerned with. 
What? Uh, just the guy on the left kind of reminds me of Lurch. I don't know. <laughs> He's just taller what? and has a silly face. I don't he does look some, like somebody who would be an alien yeah. in Men in Black. <laughs> Why'd you make me think of Men in Black? I'm sad now. Why? I don't like that movie. I do wish, like, I don't miss any of the 1950s. I wasn't around for it, but, like, I don't, like, I've been saying this for a while now, where it's, like, I miss the era where you could, like, produce a happy musical with no, like, caveats. It's just, like, no, it's a feel-good musical, and it would make a shit ton of money, and people would go <laughs> go to see it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's the 50s, like, maybe it was because... The Soviets hadn't, I don't know, they got a bomb pretty early on in the 50s. But, like, maybe it was because of the fact that we were so sure we were gonna about to blow each other up that, like... I mean, yeah, people, like, I mean, we always know that that type of nostalgia for the 50s America is wrong and racist and just, like, completely suppresses everything about it. Yeah. But, like, people were sure that World War Three had just started because of Korea. Yeah. So. Like, that's where we're at. Like, what fucking joyous time to live. We're gonna blow each other up with, like, super weapons and uh at least all the white men have barbecues <laughs> what a great time but yeah i uh i just think that would be nice too but also you have you have to find a way to do it and also i don't necessarily think that that type of musical is even uh as good as it seems sometimes no no no, sometimes I completely agree with you, but like there's so many in all forms of entertainment today, there's just so much like, oh, we have to appeal to the sense of realism. We have to be negative. We have to pull in this just like, oh, isn't this tragic? Even in movies with feel good messages, a lot of times it's just like the entire rest of the movie is just like somber and depressing and the hap quote unquote happy ending is just like, oh, they get to go on living. And it's like... Sometimes I want entertainment just to like make me feel good <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and not make me just like, Oh, life is horrible. And that's where this movie could have been more intelligent too. in it's, I don't know, comments or thoughts on things like that are more avant-garde or high art is if it had been a little bit more, uh, uh, specific, right. And or talked about like a sense of seriousness. Maybe that is not necessarily, but again, it's like, if it's talking about other musicals too, like, what is it referring to? Yeah. Singing in the rain? <laughs> the movie that it is the trying dour, to be. Yeah. wet blanket of a movie that is singing in the rain. Yeah. So so depressing. Yeah. So it seems like it's imagining something that doesn't exist to try to differentiate itself from. That's the weird thing about, and like... who the, knows? We weren't alive in the 50s. Maybe there was, like, a big cultural sense of just, like... Maybe there's references to it explicitly, and we just yeah. are oblivious. All of our listeners who were growing up in the 50s, <laughs> let us know. All of you who are there. Send us a letter in the mail and yeah. we'll get around to reading it. He just totally manipulates this fucking loser. <laughs> I see he has a room in uh, the Trump Hotel. Ugh. <laughs> Gold is so gaudy. It looks awful. It does. You can use it effectively, but like the point of gold is it like it's a trim. It's like something you use to accentuate something. You can't have something made entirely of gold or you look desperate. No, I think we've got to exclude it entirely. No. I think we, we should the more hold you vote. The more you exclude it entirely, the more the rich feel good for having it. So No, I say if you have it, you're wrong. That's what I say from now on. You can say that, but the more the unwashed mashes don't like it, the more the rich will be like, okay, cool, it's exclusively ours. So I what I'm saying is you need to make gold so overused it becomes trashy and then nobody uses it again. Oh, you like the thing with lobsters, but the other way around. Yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a good idea. <laughs> but anyway, here is Sid Charisse, who I think is uh, underutilized in this movie, unfortunately, and because uh, she disappears sort of in the second half a little bit. And uh, I think she's quite great. I think she's a very good dancer. And I think she's like, 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 I don't know. I think she's like so precise. 
in her dance movements. Like to call her elegant, I think is the wrong word, but there's like an energy and, um, I don't know, I guess just precision to the way she moves that I find like very, very engaging to watch. And also I just think she's like a more compelling actor in this movie. I like her performance a little bit more than Fred Astaire. So I I don't know if I agree with that. And I think part of that is just what the movie ends up having her do toward the end. Yeah. I mean, she does disappear. She does disappear. And then it's just sort of like, Oh, I love you now. I was like, what you can have this moment of them. Like sort of bonding over different things with like, Oh, I love you now. And listen, I'm a sucker sucker for like the rivals to lovers type thing, but like it's not done that great in here. And she is great in the first half when she's allowed to sort of do her own thing. But I don't know. I I think it's just another sort of thing that doesn't work quite as well as I want it to in this movie. Although I do think it's really interesting that this sequence, the introduction to her does have the like shot reverse shot because it does set up something we've talked about in a number of different movies like the whole idea of like visual pleasure and narrative cinema, that great essay by Laura Mulvey. Right. And this movie does play into the whole like possession of women, woman as an erotic object through, um, narcissistic identification with the male lead, but then also just presenting them as like a type of erotic object for the camera too, in a certain sense. And also the male lead plays into that too. And, um, it seems at, like I want to play devil's ad- advocate sort of where the thing that this movie is also going to suggest in the subtext is like a, I don't want to say like emancipation, but, um, by the way, that outfit. Awesome. With the polka dots. Oh uh, yeah. But, the um, wardrobe in this wardrobes in this movie are wonderful. I mean, as with pretty- most Vincent Minnelli movies. Yeah. They're pretty great. Um, but I want to suggest maybe that part of this movie subtext too, is the idea of, the Sid Charisse character in transforming herself out of this world of ballet, which as we've discussed is a very, think of it as like restrictive and um, scripted form of dance with very little spontaneity and room for personal interjection into what the choreography is into something that is more like entertainment and spontaneous and freer and open to like improvisation I think the movie sort of suggests that that's also like a type of emancipation from the controlling men. You know what I mean? When you have Jeffrey Cordoba, who's like, you know, that very typical type of like Uber male author, but then also her boyfriend and choreographer who is seemingly in charge of her career in a certain sense or wants to be thinks he is. And also just literally controls the way she moves on stage, which in this Vincent Minnelli movie, as we've established, the way you move on a stage is almost everything about you. So if you are controlled by a man in that restrictive, limited way, who also tries to like control your career, as we see later, I think that would be the movie suggesting that it's a type of like freeing yourself from that and becoming more independent. But that's not all that also is not actually what happens either. Yeah. Yeah. Because as we've seen, the entertainment side of this is already established with Fred Astaire. And he will come to, as we see in the success of the show that coincides with like their romance being consummated. Right? Yeah. So it just seems like a transformation into a different type of object maybe for a different man. So I don't know. All I know is I just noticed that fucking creepy ass lamp. What the fuck is that? <laughs> I do love all the stuff in this though. I mean, look how beautiful this decor is. <laughs> I love the weird little folk drawings of children walking down the street <laughs> behind her in the background. Yeah, I don't even know what that is, but it's just so amazing to look at. And I just... I just appreciate how much thought this movie puts into its use of color. Like the fact that I know they definitely were like, we need her gloves to be green, a very specific green to contrast with a very specific color of the walls. It's just great. And I, I am right there with you where I wish movies were like in this day and age, if not like entirely, you know, happy go lucky. I wish they had 
more of like an allowance they gave themselves to participate in this type of like exuberance with color and um, characters expressing their emotions. You know what I mean? It yeah. doesn't have to all be positive, but allow yourself to just indulge in all this stuff because it's a lot of fun to watch. I think one thing that should not be neglected too is, um, oh God, what's that actor's name? Who I love plays how Cordova? I love how we see like all the rich bigwigs are still wearing fur coats when they're in there, which means they had secondary fur coats they took <laughs> off, off when they came in to reveal their secret under, yeah, neath fur coats. Oh God. I think he he's really good, no, Cordova. He's, he's fun. He's pretty fun in this. And also, let's not forget that the sort of romantic conflict that's going to like flare up here, which is like a key central part of most Hollywood romance stories, is that <laughs> they can't just like each other immediately. They have to like not sort of like each other is uh, entirely Fred Astaire's fault. Do you yeah. think the movie's aware of that or is that us being like Looking you're insecure? Back. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the other thing is like if you're aligning... Sid Charisse with the ballet and the art side of this dichotomy. And then you're aligning Fred Astaire with a different type of dance, the more like big band, like musical vaudevillian maybe type of dance uh, that we sort of associate with those earlier 30, 30s musicals maybe. I think that when you just conclude that like the entertainment side of that debate is correct and dismiss the other, then Sid Charisse is the only one that has to change. So when he's responsible for this and he's like, oh, I'm I'm a stout young man. I had to promise I could still dance. It just seems like him being a dick. Yeah, like but it also sheds how more uncomfortable this romance subplot makes me because she's like, oh, I used to watch all of your movies when I was a little girl. Yeah, it's like, uh, oh, man, I can't wait to do funny face when he's doing this with Audrey Hepburn uh, several years later. Uh, by the way that's like a weird but you know what's funny about that is that audrey hepburn would would be like i want to work with these people the same thing happened which we're funny face is a stanley donan movie and i really like that movie and that actually funny face has a lot of similarities to this but i think it's better um and i i just love audrey hepburn so fucking much but also stanley donan did in 1963 63 charade which at that point in time, Audrey Hepburn, 1963, so she's a little bit older, but her romantic counterpart is Cary Grant in that. And even he was like, I'm too old. Yeah. <laughs> and that was his last romantic lead movie, I think. But you know what, Max? Audrey uh -huh. Hepburn said, I won't do the movie without Cary Grant. Uh -huh. And you know what, though? They're fucking great together in that movie. You best believe. That movie is phenomenal. Uh -huh. I love charades so much. Who was it? Was it Pierce Brosnan who stopped, like, refused to keep doing Bond because he was just like, it got to the point where my love interests, like, could be my granddaughters, and I'm just like... I'm too creeped out. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do this. I'm sorry. They, because he'll still have to, like, kiss them on... That's just creepy. Like, yeah. and I'm... I know that since but you and I are, like, slightly younger, right? Yeah. Um, And definitely the more you age out of your teens into your twenties, when you look back at people who are only technically like maybe five to six years younger than you, you look at them and you're like, you are a baby. Yeah. Cause when you're a teenager, you're just like, Oh, everybody's the same. It's whatever. And then right. you get into your twenties and you're just like, well, oh, I would never kiss a teenager if my life depended you're on like, it. That's like the horrifying <laughs> to think about. Yeah. But then like they have to do the same thing. And you're like now like a 50 year old man. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> I couldn't, I can't imagine doing that. Yeah. Ugh. But yeah, I mean, the whole thing with Fred Astaire too is even he at this point, I, he was in his early 50s. He was on the verge of retiring. When they make that joke about him being washed up, that's obviously a very meta thing because I don't think he had been in a big movie in several years at this point. In fact, I can't even think of a musical he was in in the early 50s aside from this one. The one I think of like earlier than this is like the Easter parade, which at this point is like five years earlier. That movie's awesome too. Also directed by an, another one of those big musical directors of the forties and fifties, Charles Walters. 
Those seats are very ugly. <laughs> they are very <laughs> ugly. But you know what? I like the color coordination. Vincent Minnelli is great with color. And that's the other thing we talked about, too. Like, we didn't do a prep screening this week because we got busy with holiday stuff. But when we were just getting ready, thinking about, like, maybe part of the reason why Vincent Minnelli wasn't... There was a debate about his auteurship uh, through the decades is maybe, like, a failure of film culture, which might have been more masculine in its identification of authorship, um, as a lot of things are probably likely to be, wouldn't recognize things that are maybe assumed to be more feminine modes of authorship, things like coordination of different colors in this very exuberant way, or things like outfits or things like sets or things, you know, they think mostly of like camera movement. Why would you make this lady do this in high heels? (laughs) I mean, I guess it's good for, warping your foot in the same way that you need to to ballet dance, but still. Yeah. And there's a lot of things in this sequence that you'll see that are mirrored later, but done successfully. But again, this is part of what we realize when we look at the visual logic of this movie and how this movie argues that entertainment wins out over everything else. Um, And everything else, even more specific than musicals, that is not a review musical is in this movie's eyes kind of like inferior because there is this discoordination of movement here, which is so key to the logic of this movie. In fact, I'm just going to read this uh, quick quote where it is a question of, su- of substantiating or explaining a human relationship in terms of psychological motivation. Minnelli therefore invariably presents the conflict as a clash of settings an imbalance of stylistic elements, such as contrast of movements or disharmony of colors or objects. Right? Yeah. And that's the whole thing of this is like, is he wearing a hat or is he not wearing a hat? Okay. And we're also like just on the stairs or whatever. We'll see later the most obvious examples, like the day before their opening, when they tried to do the big thing, all the sets go in like opposite directions and they're supposed to move and they crash into each other. (laughs) Is it intentional? Because her outfit has matched the, uh, color of the room around her in the last like four scenes well not when she was wearing the dress and green gloves i'd say that's true the but, like contrast if you're gonna ask about like matching it's contrast is good but also like she was wearing a yellow dress and that she's wearing the red dress for that but to speak about color that's another interesting thing because i know that at the time there was this designation for a specific shade of red which people called Minnelli red because he would use it so frequently in his movies really and i i'm not sure i would be able to point out exactly like okay that red thing that is Minnelli red only that red is a color he would use often and that also leads some people to maybe suspect whether or not he's trying to like lampoon himself in this cordova character because if you remember his introduction what's the entire set in this oedipus thing big red pillar (laughs) yeah everything's red yeah and um, there's the red smoke when he's like wearing the Dracula cape or whatever. So I'm not sure. But then again, Minnelli, I don't think was ever the type of person who had those aspirations of being like, or pretensions, I should say, of being that high art, serious type of director. He was the guy who made musicals and melodramas yeah. for MGM. Uh, and I know I've talked with you about this before, but like as much as I love like rivals to lovers, the there's a very thin line between that yeah. and the, like the it's been in a lot of romantic comedies, but like you see it a lot in like really shitty ones that come out in the more modern era of just like, they fucking hate each other, but this Christmas <laughs> they'll find the true meaning of love. Yeah. And this movie borders on that for me sometimes. And because of the fact that we have such spectacular sets, actors and musical numbers, you just don't buy it. You mean I don't buy it. And it makes me like, ugh, it kind of uncomfortable. Turn- yeah. What about it specifically? Um, I, I get it's more for the audience, but like, I think it kind of perpetuates the idea that we have like that's in culture. That's just like, 
you're gonna fucking hate your spouse. But that's what marriage is, fucking hating your spouse and your loved one, where I'm just like, why can't they just like each other? I don't think it's so much that. Definitely some of them I think it plays into the same culture of it. I'm not saying it's like, it's just like, yeah, you're going to mainly argue with the person you love, but in the end, love will win out. And it's like, no, you should enjoy the time you're hmm. spending around the person you I don't love. know if I agree with that. I think it's more just a central formal element of romantic movies coming out of Hollywood. It's like central to the genre. <sighs> I get it. That there is an impediment in them re-educating each other to fit their idea of gender that is acceptable as a romantic partner. But in this movie, it's modified because it's a musical, but also like it is taking on that Minnelli-esque type of characterization that can only express itself in dance. That's why their big moment where they really start to bond is the dancing in the dark sequence where they are dancing in central park together. And there's no words really. It's just them learning each other's moves. Right. And that's them bonding in a character way. That's the part of it. I would say the thing about that, that idea is being fundamental to American Hollywood romances is more when you watch the old ones, it's like, it's, it's kind of interesting to notice how that is frequently the way in which it seems like it feels dated in terms of what is considered like appropriate ideas of what affection is versus just creepy, gross behavior, you know, where it's like, okay, so they have the idea of the romance is they don't like each other at the beginning, but somehow this will be reconciled and they will realize they love each other by the end. But in the way we get from one to the other, different generations obviously have a different and sometimes very, very misguided idea of what that appropriate behavior is. And that's the thing we've talked about a lot. It expresses itself most conspicuously in scenes that are treated as sex scenes, but are actually just rape. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whether people know it or not is actually just rape. Right, that's the most conspicuous example. You fuck those books up. Yeah, beat beat <laughs> it up. Beat it up. Beat it up. <laughs> beat it up. This was the epitome of destruction in 1950s movies. Tap dancing destruction. Unbreakable. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good That play is like almost yeah. like a cartoon where it's like <laughs> There's some good stuff in here about that. Oh, I I am also going to say that Sid Therese's very quickly going to have the best line in the movie here where she's like, don't be nice to me. (laughs) Oh God. I love that. It's amazing. She's got a picnic basket. (laughs) Uh, You know, it's funny though. If you look at the painting in the back right there, Max, that is the exact painting painted by that dude's brother from the Gorgon. Do you remember that? I was going to say that painting reminds me of remember that when that woman touched up the picture of Jesus Christ and it just ended up looking fucking (laughs) terrible. It's that picture. Max, that's rude. To what? The person who touched up the the picture of Jesus Christ? I don't know. But yeah, so um, we just have more of uh, Fred Astaire being kind of like an asshole. I'm so great. But then he sells them and that makes him selfless and entertainment. Oh, also we talked over something in the uh, prior scene where he gets fed up and then storms off. Something that I think really hits home. Like the, the thing of our problems with this movie's idea of entertainment versus art um, in a way that makes it more than just being like nitpicks that I find kind of like eh, where I, I think that the the line I'm referencing is really what also sparks a lot of the conversations of this movie kind of taking like an anti-intellectualism stance in 1953. Um, and the idea that uh, when he says, I'm not like, you know, Fred Astaire in 1953, I'm declaring my independence, Fred Astaire, 1776. And that's that entertainment is the good old American entertainment. Well, they say that in entertainment in the beginning where it's just like, it's the American way. Yes. Like (laughs) they say it multiple times. And then there's other interesting things that sort of reference it where even Sid Charisse, she's like, she's like, he's, it's like dancing with like a figure of general grant. It's like, Oh, he's like a historical American thing. And now you've, you've brought it into politics. Right. And it's like, well, hold on now. (laughs) 
Nostalgia and politics do not tend to like mix yeah. super well. <laughs> she just, don't be nice to me. I love that line so much. She's amazing. Um, also, like, totally, a, that's like the most relatable line in this movie. Don't be nice to me. It felt most authentic, yeah. <laughs> but um, if it wasn't for her fake wailing, then I'd, I don't know. Oh, she's good in this. No, she's good in this. Movie. She is. No, she's great. I'm just saying, like, it comes off as like that scene, like the line between, like, oh, right, this is a movie that somebody wrote is thin at that because that's not how humans act. <laughs> None of this is how people act. Yeah. I'm enjoying this artifice, sort of. Well, yeah, that's kind of what musicals are to a degree, though. Yeah, they're it's, the height of artifice. Yeah. But um, what was I just saying? Oh, so like anti-intellectualism, nostalgia. So another interesting thing going on in 1953, or more conspicuously in 1954, of course, from Wisconsin's own, Senator, Senator Joseph McCarthy, right? Targeting who else but those Hollywood liberals with their fancy fucking ideas <laughs> and uh, kicking them out of something. The kicking them out of the club. That's what he's doing. But I do think that retreating into the type of anti-intellectualism at the time this movie came out, given all this political stuff going on, I do think kind of like is like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, it's not at all like an explicit connection, but this movie definitely does associate this entertainment stuff with with uh, an idea of American history kind of. And American like folksiness. And that's the thing about the musical too is that <laughs> Do you think I could go up to a horse driver in New York today and just be like, I'll oh, leave it to the horse. They'll be like, ah, fuck you. <laughs> Probably. But I mean, look at okay, so what is happening? They were gonna take a cab and then what else? What happened? Nah, we're gonna take the horse and buggy. We're gonna take the old thing, the American thing. The old fashioned yeah, because cars aren't American at all. Nope. <laughs> Not even a little. I mean, the French technically invented them. So, Max, I've never seen a pickup truck in France, in America. <laughs> nope, nobody likes them. Nobody likes cars in America. Yeah, that's why the little Nas X song was "Old Town Road." I'm going to take my horse to the old round town road. It's not. I'm going to take my yes. truck. Yeah. Nobody's ever heard of trucks and country music, and that's the most American mu- form of music. It was a word. Invented by the French. <laughs> wow, look how blue that water is. Yeah. <laughs> that does not look good to drink. Do not let that horse drink that. He'll turn into one of those Wizard of Oz horses. <laughs> no, that's what they used to do. It's just like, oh, if you give the horse opium, they're very calm. Don't kick anybody. <laughs> it's like catnip or something. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, look. Just l- people dancing in Central Park, you know. Yeah, because as New Yorkers definitely do and then get up in their sunday's best and go dance in the park but you know what it's not just some crackhead peeing in the middle of it in the middle of the night but like this is what the movie wants is like it wants to establish this idea of the entertainment as being folksy american without pretensions and also like where true romance happens and where reality is even though of course that's the ultimate lie because this is a musical and the most produced type of movie in hollywood right so it is, it is something where it's like, um, to quote another essay that I will link to in the show notes from, uh, Jane, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. Fjord, F-E-U-E-R, F-E-U-E-R. How would you say that? F-U-E-R? F-E-U-E-R. Fiori? I don't know. It's not Guy Fiori. Fiori, not Fieri. <laughs> no, that's what Riddick is, right? He's a Fury. <laughs> Sorry to bring up Riddick again. No, you're not. <laughs> You love that movie. But um, she really does give a really good breakdown in this essay about like the myth of spontaneity in musicals. I think the essay is called The Self-Reflexive Musical, which a lot of them are because a lot of them are backstage musicals. And um, the thing about this is that it wants to treat what is like cultural, as in these dance moves, as if it were natural, right? The choreographed artifice is treated as if it's the most spontaneous improvised thing in the world and of course that's a myth right <sighs> but that's what i love i i wish people it is enjoyable to watch yeah i i wish people could just impromptu start singing and do a choreographed dance number in the middle of the day and then just carry on with their lives you know what i'm i i enjoy watching this movie and everything max and i like the people in it 
I cannot wait now that we've done this and established certain things with this commentary track. We are so we are going to be so primed for those fucking Jacques Demi musicals. You have no idea. You have no idea how much you're going to love all those musicals. Those musicals, I think, are really like he is one of the best directors ever. Like his movies are amazing. Lola is definitively one of the best debut feature films I've ever seen in my life. It's like up there with Citizen Kane and like Twelve Angry Men. Shrek. <laughs> Somebody once told me. Uh, Listen, Smash Mouth has used Shrek to just become immortal. They, they don't care anymore. Is there a retro? Is there, well, not retro, but like a hipster type of revival of Smash Mouth yet? They, no, they just became like uh, internet memes. Their Twitter account is very powerful. But Did like, I ever show you that like S- Smash Mouth All Star like re edited as like. Um, the Rite of Spring no. video. <laughs> well, we got to watch that now. It's great. I love that video. I, I've seen remix. I've seen a lot of remixes of that. I've seen my favorite. Well, I have a very stupid sense of humor, but some of my favorite things is when people just take one line from a song or one word and just make the entire song that. So I've seen somebody, somebody, somebody. <laughs> God damn it. <Yeah>. Um. <laughs> you know what, Max? We should start a game on the show. Where if we can just, as we're talking, say lyrics from a song without the other person noticing, <laughs> as if we're just talking. No, that'd because be pretty good. you've tried to do that to me before and you always do. <laughs> Wait, what? What did I do? I got to choose a song you don't recognize. You've done Down With The Sickness too many times. No, that's not what I'm doing when I do that. I don't even know the lyrics to that song. I'm assuming they say Down to this, <laughs> Down With The Sickness in it. <laughs> I like to imagine that guy was just sitting there and like was looking at them at first and was like, oh, okay. That's why I get these guys off, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to dance in the middle of the park at night. Yeah, unfortunately, we just talked over this entire amazing dance sequence by saying stupid nonsense. Yeah, well, but, that's the Spectator Film Pod. <laughs> it is. But also, that's just one of the interesting things about dance movies, too, and why dance movies are so interesting to read criticism about because there's so many different things you can talk about. I'm also going to link to something I didn't even mention, but I have also found an essay about that dance sequence specifically and the very type of dances that how they're interacting with one another with Sid Charisse and Fred Astaire in a entire book of criticism just about, like, dance stuff. It's like a dance critical companion. And um, definitely I think this sit, like set is a great embodiment of like what would be like Minnelli-esque like disharmony or like failure to actualize your like actual like satisf- I don't know, desires, creative impulse. If you look at that composition, there's like all these set pieces or whatever or like you know, walls from different sets and they're all angled in different directions and your eye just has no idea where to look. It's all going in different directions. It's totally chaotic. And uh, that is just telling you that this show is not going to work. Uh, Did you see that thing on Twitter? It was like a trending thing for a while where people were just like, what's something you can say during blank but not during sex? Oh, yeah. That was created by... uh, it was one of those corporate ad Twitter things. Was it? Yeah. I mean, that was an old uh, running joke on a whose line is it anyway back in the day. But um. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they just stole that. But the best one I saw was just like somebody did a musicals. Like what's something you can say during a, like while watching a musical but not during sex. And somebody referenced, uh, what was it? The Love Never Dies, the sequel to Phantom of the Opera. And it was just like, I'm really liking the costumes, but I just can't get into this. <laughs> I feel like you could say that during sex. Yeah, that's the point. Oh, okay. Yeah. All or, right. I'm sorry. That was the, it was the, you can say it. I fucked that up completely. I don't understand. But that guy's wearing a barnacle outfit. That looks cool. <laughs> he looks like you know, the person who plays like, uh, what's his name? Uh, Lumiere in the Aquaman. Be- <laughs> yeah, that too. What well, if Aquaman was a musical? Um, give Disney 10 more years <laughs> until they've acquired DC and they can just make musicals out of it. Oh boy. Here comes the giant thing. I have no idea what this is supposed to be, but it's fun to watch. I mean, it just straight up looks like Aquaman. <laughs> I saw Aquaman. I saw Aquaman too. Not in the theater. How did you like it, Austin? I thought it was too long. <laughs> thought it was much too long and I just didn't care. See, that's the point. What even happened in that movie? 
um, he became Aquaman. Willem Dafoe is in it. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. <laughs> Willem Dafoe was like his mentor. He's like Aristotle or someone. And no, nah, but see, the reason you see that movie is because you want to watch Jason Momoa's wet body for as long as the movie keeps going. I didn't so. think his body got that wet. It got pretty wet. I don't think so. I, I just remember him saying like, fuck you. And then he threw a guy like into a like boiler. <laughs> yep. That was the movie. And then fuck you or no. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Oh, I remember something funny about that movie. They could never have a conversation because bad guys kept like blowing up their conversation. Yeah, that was my friend and I, when we saw it in the theaters, like we literally like when a conversation went on for a certain amount of time, we'd like look at each other because we knew the side of the screen was about to explode. <laughs> that would be a really good like thing to do where you're just like, I'm a director writer and I think the conversation scenes in this are annoying. So I'm going to end all of them with an explosion. <laughs> Every basically what it was. One. It was yeah. hilarious. It was like James Wan is just being like, oh, the scene's going on for too long. Bye. He's just got like a button. <laughs> Explode. She smokes now, so she's better. It's good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Coats your lungs and protective tar to stop all the bad stuff from getting in there. Yeah. It's like makeup for your lungs. <laughs> this guy has not changed his red sweater in years. Well, months, weeks, days. I don't know. Two days. <laughs> uh, what? I love, like, the boyfriend character, like, exists just to be like, listen, we know it's creepy that they fall in love after not knowing each other at all, but look how shitty the guy she's already seeing is, so it's fine. No, I think the movie definitely buys into their romance. And I think if I, the, I, it, maybe it's just because I don't buy into it, but I think it's maybe you because I don't think it's the best like plotted or like in terms of if you're really focusing on the romance that you're really like, like the movie is holding that up as its top priority, which would make it better. But I also think just in terms of the logic of the movie, it's like it's all about them being able to dance together. Right. So they don't have many scenes together until they get like to this point, really. Um, and it's not like you get many one-on-one -on -one moments with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it is when the movie gets us to the point where they're doing the dancing in the dark sequence, it's like, well, now we're kind of ready for it, you know? Yeah. And that's the movie's logic. And that's the other thing too. Um, well, it's more like, I, I feel like that's them like basically being like, listen, we're both professionals. We can do this and work together. I just didn't see that as romantic, but maybe... Right, because me. you don't read into it that yeah. from you. But by the movie's logic, they are destined to be romantically entwined. I guess. He, yeah. was, he was a boy and she was a girl. Can I make it my name more obvious? He was a not Punk. a boy. <laughs> he was not a boy and she was a woman. He was a old man who was... He was a punk and she did ballet. What more can I say? <laughs> God damn it. That's also one of my favorite conspiracy theories is that they killed off Avril Lavigne years ago. <laughs> What? What uh, the fuck does that have to do with that's what I was, anything? I was singing Skater Boy. By oh, Arbol you got me. <laughs> you So you're winning in the game now. Yeah. I was going to say, that sounds like an embarrassing thing. Some sort of like emo person would write in the song. I was about to say that for real. Uh, oh, man, you're winning. Fuck. <laughs> oh, man, I got to get you with something. Okay. Oh, New Haven Theater. Ooh Whoa, Connecticut movie. No, this is New York. We got to do the movie Boomerang by Elia Kazan, because that takes place right in Connecticut. I don't want to do Connecticut movies. I want to forget I live in this place by watching things in faraway locations. God, Connecticut is so awful. Like New York City, <laughs> um, a place I can take a train to any day of the week. But You know, uh, we, we love the fact of this, but basically if any of our listeners know the movie The Horror at Party Beach, that was shot on a beach that is literally 10 minutes from where we are. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Only Ooh. there's no parties. <laughs> it's definitely not party beach. There's and plenty there are of horror. no monsters. There's plenty of horror there, though. It's mainly just people addicted to opioids. The Connecticut's a boring ass state, and there's nothing to do here. There's um, water cats or those things. 
There's like <laughs> otter looking animals that are really nasty. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, Fisher cats. Yeah, we got those. Go. And uh Yeah. Really nobody should ever do a podcast about Connecticut because <laughs> they don't know what to say. Connecticast? Oh, stop. <laughs> Please do not. That's a swell looking robe. If you're about to start shooting, shouldn't you change out of your bathrobe and get ready in your costume? They're not. They're going to they're going to open like Oh no, they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even Fred Astaire is in a robe. It's a bathrobe and somewhere along like his mad promises, one of the wealthy donors was like what if they were all wearing bathrobes? And he's like, yes, that's part of our vision. Yes. So now everybody's just wearing bathrobes in this weird it's, version of Faust. It's like that scene from Orson Welles' Othello. Oh, wait a minute. Further hammer home the spontaneity of this because they couldn't get the outfits because they were late with the outfits. And famously, Max, famously. Famously. Uh, what For they, all five What people. they did was that they, instead of using the high, like, flutin Shakespearean outfits, Orson Welles was like, fuck it, we're going to film this. We're in Morocco. Let's film this in a giant bathhouse. And they did. And uh, it's actually a really amazing scene. It's a really incredible scene, the bathhouse scene. <sighs> this is the weirdest transition. There's a lot of weird. Like... Where it becomes entirely like metaphorical. And again, Isle of the Dead painting reference and Val Luton reference? Or I don't understand. Is he saying that Val Luton laid eggs? Yes. This bastard. <laughs> Vincent Minnelli. I, th- I just took it as a callback to like, they're trying to create fine art and we're showing uh fine art pieces. Like the, like the paintings he had back in the room. Cause the, I don't know that, that shit is like fighting words. If you're going to say Val Luton laid eggs, cause he had pretenses of being a like high art person no, who made horror movies. That's not what I'm saying at all. No, no, no I'm saying the movie. No. Oh. I think, I don't know what to think really of the movie. In its opinion on that, but like Vincent Minnelli, I like you watch those Val Luton movies and you thought they were bad. You fucking jackass. No. And everybody hates it because it was a mishmash of. If only it had been about Nazis. It would have been a big hit. They should have just done that. <laughs> oh, it's pathetic. Yeah, they even got a guy to carve the swan. Do you know how expensive that is? I was making a terrible joke to my coworker the other day that I totally should have gone into culinary school to learn how to carve those swans. Why? Because you got rich. The only market is for rich people, so you could just be like, money, money, money. Give me. Oh, man, they even have a taxidermied pheasant right next to the... (laughs) Turkey club sandwiches. Wouldn't at least the rest of the cast be here though? No. Cause again, this is the formal exclusive high art party. The rest of the cast is in the cool spontaneous party in the person's room. And they're singing about getting more beer, <laughs> right? Uh, that makes me hungry. I feel like a buffet table is a good metaphor for this movie. You know, you've got lots of delicious things laid up on, on this exuberant table, almost to the point where it's like overflowing with like wonderful, amazing things. Yeah, not everything on the table is the best you've ever had, but it's all pretty good. And maybe not all of it is like something you would combine together on one plate. Yeah, but <laughs> or, or want to eat in general. But But it's like... There's a lot of stuff there you do like. Yeah, I really do enjoy it. You could even make it more specific. You're at the MGM Christmas orgy. And, you know, since you're the one who's a little bit skeeved out, maybe you think it's non-hygienic. You're hanging out more by the snacks table. And that's what this movie is. They got pizza and pretzels. And this is... See, the swanky party was dumb because nobody was there. 
but this party that has people on it is better. <laughs> See the message? Yeah, it's all about this idea of spontaneity. And also, like... What I'm saying, like, I, I'm surprised, like, she and the writers and James Cordova or whatever wasn't there um, at the fancy party, is all I'm saying. But No, because they were in an even more fancy party. Oh, okay. But, I mean, look at some of the similarities, too, between the way those people are dancing in the background terribly, I might add. And uh, the stuff at Central Park. And then also one thing that I think you notice in a lot of the scenes that are talking about like rejuvenating an idea of spontaneity and entertainment are referring to other characters in a way that is like comparing them to children. Referring to them as kids or um, I remember when uh, Fred Astaire is talking about originally before that's entertainment. He's about to duck out of the project because he feels like he's not a good fit for it. And he says, I'm going to take my marbles home. Right? Yeah. And just the idea of comparing it to like a penny arcade in the first place. It's all just a penny arcade, right? And that's what the good stuff is. Really, I wouldn't have any problem with that. I mean, I would still find it like dismissive and like, eh. But the weird thing is when it does associate it with like Ulysses S. Grant or like 1776 or the American way. That's what it's like. Hold on now. Can we relax? I'm pretty sure Mickey Splane is very intent on letting you know he's a fucking red-blooded American. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Also, they're singing a song in German. What the fuck is this? Louisa? What? Well, who is this? Fuck you. That's not an American name. <laughs> she be, should be named Mary Kennedy Roosevelt <laughs> Washington Hamilton the Third. Her name is Martha. <laughs> No, we can't have anybody named Martha in movies anymore. Sorry. What are you talking about? After Batman v oh, Superman, Jesus. you're not allowed to. Oh, God. That, who cares? That name is forever ruined. I'm sorry. No one cares about any of this. Everybody does. You're the only one who doesn't, unfortunately. Well, you're all really going to hate it when I become emperor. There's <laughs> going to be no more Batman. No more Superman. No more wars among the stars. Also... I don't know if this makes me un-American, but out of the drinks he's just listed between wine, whiskey, and beer, I would prefer literally <laughs> any of the other two over beer. Also, a lot of people in uh, who are like the extras here look so much like Fred from <laughs> Scooby-Doo. I just noticed that. It's like really interesting. Well, yeah, because Fred was the most conservatively dreft, dressed out of all of them. The other ones were wearing a hip. Yeah, they're just like Fred. It's like, they wow. They were wearing hip 60s fashion. Fred was still stuck in the late 50s. Yeah. <laughs> But in the end, he's the one who gets the girl because he's the most stable person. Does he, though? Yes. I think they just assume he does. But also, he's just like... Well, I mentioned that thing before. There's a Scooby-Doo movie where they're like trying to imply that the like Fred and Daphne don't live together. So they have Daphne and Velma and Shaggy and Fred live in like separate houses together. But it just makes them like come off as like a weird, like two sets of weird gay couples just who like hang out. The Scooby Doo <laughs> version of like Charlie Manson and like Spawn Ranch. <laughs> I'm not where I was going, but okay. <laughs> I'm just, you're, at, I was saying cute gay couples solving mystery together. Okay. But. I'm imagining that, <laughs> right? And then I'm imagining Shaggy smoking a lot of weed and listening to the Beatles. But anyway, Shaggy's a Grateful Dead kind of guy. I he is. I think he is. Yeah. It makes me respect him less, honestly, and it's disappointing. Do you think he would like fish? I hope not. I don't think anybody has ever enjoyed fish while they're sober. Only people from Vermont. While they're sober. You mean while they're sober? I said nobody. Or while they're drunk? Nobody in Vermont has Are they always so drunk? Nobody in Vermont That's is the sober. Answer. Okay. Not drunk. No, you don't enjoy fish while you're drunk. You enjoy it while you're stoned out of your mind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Every time I listen to fish, it makes my skin crawl. Well, yeah, because you're straight edge. Oh, and he's going to give him the business here. I'm here with all the kids, right? So kids, children, spontaneous, having fun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The real interesting thing, too, is that we are about to experience a major shift in uh, 
in the way this movie is presenting itself as a musical. It is in this first half, much more of a narrative oriented musical. And a lot of the musical numbers are sort of subordinated to the narrative, but it is now just going to become a straight up like review musical where I really do wonder like what the fuck type of story includes (sighs) all the songs we're about to see. Like we're going to see something about like a bunch of people having sex in a hayride. And then also like, people talking about a woman who fell for another man or whatever while wearing top hats or something like a Busby Berkeley mu- uh, musical. And then also like Sid Charisse singing about the sun. So I don't know what those things have to do together with the, each other. But then also the, like the girl hunt sequence at the end. Oh my God, that was a weird trivia thing that I learned about this movie too. Um, and looking up stuff about it, is that Mickey Spillane actually wound up writing a book called The Girl Hunters in like the 60s. Yeah. And I don't know if he saw this movie. I feel like he probably is not interested in musicals, but that's just amusing. Oh, and look, Max, the paintings are going to finance... Yeah. Our entertainment now, because fuck the paintings, right? It's fuck high art. It should just be entertainment. And you know what? Even those guys liked the theater. You know, they would probably agree with it. Yeah. Which I mean, they probably have no thoughts because they're dead. Nobody would buy their art <laughs> till they're dead or whatever. I don't know if that's true of Degas though. But again, Degas. If you are going to choose a painter, it is interesting they choose Degas, who had so many. Uh, paintings and artistic works of uh, ballet dancers. That's being something that he's kind of famous for. Um, You know who this boyfriend character reminds me of, sort of uh, comparing him to like other characters from movies we've done on the show, is the boyfriend character from The House of Wax. Oh, yeah. And you will remember that character is also like an artist and a choreographer of sorts in the sense that he's a sculptor and manipulates the artificial woman's body into the movements, or not movements because they're sculpt figures, but the positions and stature that he wants because he's an author with a vision. And, of course, in that movie, it does kind of compare and contrast him with the Vincent Price character in a way that sort of seems like it's commenting on that boyfriend character's, like, existence on a continuum with Vincent Price as like this controlling man who's like, I don't know, manipulating people into this mold, right? Yeah. Philadelphia. We're going to go to Philadelphia and we're going to go to Chicago and we're going to go to New York all the way to Washington. Yeah. What? T- talk about gaudy. <laughs> no, this is beautiful. Look at her outfit. That outfit's amazing. Yellow is hard to pull off. <laughs> it's not just yellow, it's also orange. I don't know. I think it looked really great. Do you have a favorite um, musical number from this? And that question is sort of twofold both in terms of like the song itself and also just the set so- piece. song itself is obviously entertainment dance. Number wise would probably be dancing in the dark. Really? Uh, I, th- I think it's simple and intimate and just the actors managed to get across the entire point of the scene solely through their dance moves and their body language yeah. toward each other. Do you think it works in the story though? Because I got the impression from what you were just saying, though. No, I don't. But I think as an individual scene by itself, it works just fine. Yeah. The movie's a buffet. Yeah. This scene was when I was like, oh, okay. It's singing in the rain. (laughs) Cool. But Yeah. Which singing in the rain is also very self-aware and and meta about older musicals. It always feels like just genuine. Especially with this one, it's more of like, just going in, into like a free for all of like a review musical. Although I do feel like you could probably make an argument that a lot of the stuff we're going to see throughout this review part of the movie it, are things that are also just like present in the other first half, only they're being like represented here in a different way. And again, we're also going to see, see throughout this sort of um, 
sequence, not this sequence specifically, but most conspicuously in the girl hunt one, that again, the movie is very focused on having the consummation of the romantic subplot be linked to the successful show that they're going to put on. It's successful once these two things happen together. Do you really think audience tastes have changed? Because I do know tons of people who can't fucking stand musicals. But, like, is that just because that, like, their only exposure to them has been through obnoxious theater kids? Or, like... I think that might be part of it. And um, I'm going to use myself as an example to help answer this question. Okay. Where I I don't... in I don't want to say that I don't enjoy a lot of musicals. Because I'm trying to think of ones I really don't enjoy. And there are a lot that I'm like, I'm not excited about, but I'm trying to think of ones that like make me angry. I don't know if I can think of one off the top of my head that I've seen recently. Um, But I do feel like there's a certain attitude of like musicals and like the theater that is like, it can delve into irritating for me. And it also has to do with this movie where this movie valorizes itself so much and dismisses other things where it's like, yeah, I fucking get it. I get that you're a musical and you're a song and dance man or whatever. Right. And it becomes the thing it's supposedly trying to criticize. Yeah. Well, that's like, that's like rent for me. Oh, okay. That's where I've not seen the movie rent, but rent just in general. Yeah. But but like, it's supposed to be like a, yeah, man, we're oppressed. We're bohemian. Fuck the system. Yeah, but no, it just turns into like, I'm not paying rent. You no, know, it takes like a story that's like theoretically supposed to be about like gay people being marginalized in New York City in the 80s and being destroyed by the AIDS crisis and just turns it to, uh, I'm not going to compromise my art for paying money for things. And I'm just like, oh. To the point where it just feels annoying. Yes, where you hate every character in Rent. But it also, you know, like, and I haven't seen Rent enough times to really feel like I've seen a good example (laughs) of what it would be. Um, And I've never seen the movie. So again, it is like limited exposure, like you're saying. But you, when you do grow up here, you're going to see a lot of like musicals in high school. And that might just be your exposure to it, which it's just a bunch of high school kids. So you might just connect it to that anyway. But also like... I don't know. I just feel like there's such a valorization of like the struggling artist who's going to someday I'm going to make it in the world, you know? And it's just like, I don't care. I don't care about your stupid tap dancing shoes or whatever the fuck you got. And, um, that's something that I doesn't really irritate me about Minnelli's movies, but it is something that I don't go all in on where I'm like, these are just movies about people conquering their industry in a way where it's like, yeah, but that just kind of like suppresses reality in a way that I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, I know this isn't real. It's not real that you just did that. And when a movie that is like a backstage musical is like so much celebrating itself and specifically celebrating like a type of, um, I don't know, performance, that is right in front of you in a way that is different from other movies that take themselves seriously. Like to compare it to um, a director that I know that you are not the biggest fan of for similar reasons, even though I definitely think it's more sophisticated than sometimes what you say in the conversations we've had about him is Werner Herzog, right? Where he does things like Aguirre, the wrath of God or Fitzcarraldo. And those are really like, you're like, I can't believe what I'm watching when he's doing this. He's like taking people into the jungle and he's like, okay, I'm just going to shoot this like a documentary. Here we go. Or I'm going to drag a giant boat across land with these massive cables. And, um, that's like the typical type of male authorial thing that people will do where they're like, this is look at this insane thing we're doing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And musicals, the comparison that I'm trying to make is like, doesn't always take itself as seriously on the surface, but it is them frequently celebrating themselves as they dance for you. Instead of bringing a giant boat across a mountain, it's them tap dancing and they will talk about, Oh man, people, I'm going to sacrifice everything for this one moment where I get the fucking tap dance. And sometimes you're just like, I don't care. And you're irritating me for, for like celebrating yourself so much, but that's just what happens in backstage musicals sometimes. 
Yeah. So that's a really long winded <laughs> answer, I guess. But I think a, I think the thing is, it's just you get so many musicals that are just backstage musicals, and that's an inherent element in a lot of them is celebration of just the performance. Yeah, I guess you just have to be willing to accept that celebration. Yeah, that's also what I love about Jacques Demy is that he somehow achieves that, except they're also real people who just sing in the street. And uh, Jacques Demy, Jacques Demy, I, I just think his musicals are the best musicals. I don't think anyone else can really get to the level he's at. And his are his also evaluate that type of creative lifestyle of the person who's like, I don't know, kind of on the margins for certain reasons, but he's way more, I don't know, interested in exploring the emotional pain <laughs> that that requires as well. Yeah. And he does it in a way that is very, um, very intelligent. That guy was just an amazing filmmaker. Really incredible. <laughs> this background makes me curious about like different other things in the movie that this background might be referencing for this baby sequence. Cause there's some things that I'm like, Oh, you got a train, right? They've been on trains and then there's a wood fence or something. Uh, see, like I wasn't sure if like, they were changing it as they went on the road to try to be like, Oh, this is what we really want. Or like, or what the fucking story of this play is. Yeah. I, it doesn't matter, but I do think it's interesting to compare this sequence, especially to an earlier sequence that we've seen with these three dancing, which would be that's entertainment. Right. And that sequence is them singing and celebrating. Oh, we're going to go do this high art Faust thing. Right. Yeah. And in this, it's like, Oh, they're babies talking about how much they hate each other and how alike they are. So is this saying like their earlier idea, if these two are connected, right? Which I think they are, if you really look at the choreography, because they're going to start dancing in a certain way that I think sort of mimics them trying to step on each other's feet Yeah. in the earlier that's entertainment sequence. And, uh, yeah, this is so fucking weird. <laughs> MGM has got a Leo, but Mama's got a trio. And then they talk about shooting each other. Yeah, what the fuck is that? So the, the connection is like, I think there's a connection there, but it's like, I don't know if I have enough like intertextual knowledge of what it might be talking about or if it's just talking about itself, you know? Yeah. But it does seem to be comparing and contrasting these two songs. That's entertainment and this. And like maybe poking fun at like the serious art stuff is like you're just babies. I don't and know. And you're all alike or something. Or like other other musicals are all very alike. But MGM is different or something. I, I don't fucking know. <laughs> Do you feel yeah, do some of this does feel like he's just like, I have some other ideas for shit we can do. And, uh, well, that's the thing, too, is I think this was, again, they they made this to capitalize off of Singing in the Rain. Yeah. But this was a pre-existing show. So I think part of it, too, is like the producers were like, okay, we want the songs. You have to get these songs in there. And the writers are like, oh, uh, uh, you know? Yeah. And they did what they could. So that might that might also be a possibility. So in them trying to like rationalize a way to do it, that's why they end up with the story about random non-narrative entertainment being better than narrative art. And that's the other thing. I don't know if we mentioned it already that you and I were talking about in preparing for this movie. When we learned that it was like made after Singing in the Rain, it was like, okay, so is that also part of this movie's like focus on like valorizing itself and proving its worth while dismissing everything else is that it's like out of a place of insecurity and it's like, Oh, this is just them capitalizing off of singing in the rain, but this is real. Trust us. We're real too. In fact, we're more real than you. Other musicals we're better because we're more spontaneous and we don't have a story that limits and constricts our imagination. Yeah. We don't need a story. We just, 
do things with babies. <laughs> I want to rephrase that. We just do things with 17-year-olds. Do you think uh, in pre- preparing for like um, Lord of the Rings, some assistant brought Peter Jackson just that that sequence and then he just like crossed it off the list? A murder like, mystery no. in jazz is... Yes. Blue Velvet. If they started, okay. if they started the- look at the poster on the left. That's my favorite. Dames kill me. <laughs> and it's supposed to be like a pulpy noir hard boiled novel. But, but if you robot. look, it's a fucking alien robot. Yeah. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? <laughs> I want to see that. Dames kill me. Specifically Appar- robot. From what I read, apparently Michael Jackson was like aping this scene for the. Oh, it does look the like beat it. it video. You know what, though? Michael Jackson, a lot of his music videos are made by just really good directors. Right? Yeah. So it could be them too. I know Martin Scorsese also, he's a big champion of, of Vincent Minnelli. What did you think about this sequence the first time you watched it? Um, I think I was still baffled from the baby scene. So it was just like, oh, this is slightly more familiar. Just another random Yeah, just thing. sort of another random act. This is definitely one of the big dance sequences that people love the most from this movie. It and just, I think it's really good. It felt like, you know, it, it, it felt like a natural uh, progression almost from the dancing in the dark thing where they're like really good at playing off of each other at this yeah. point. And again, it is it is a romance story. The girl hunt sequence. Yeah. And about finding like the right woman or the specifically the right version of Sid Charisse, right? Yeah. <laughs> I do remember laughing at the wig and the bone, <laughs> but nothing but a wig and a bone. And maybe you can relate that to something else in the movie. You know what I'm also realizing is that Fred Astaire looks right into the camera many times in this movie. And I also love the bad guy dance moves mm. <laughs> in this sequence, especially when they're just like doing like cartwheels and like shooting guns later. I want to see yeah. more of that in movies. Do they have that in the Avengers? So I don't the think way they so. want to play. <laughs> and I hate her. <laughs> the dialogue makes no sense. <laughs> But it's great. It feels like if you let like a computer program write a noir novel after you <laughs> fed it a bunch of them. <laughs> oh, um, oh my god, what is it called? The machine learning yeah. book writing. I love those. <laughs> those like make me slightly more comfortable living in the illusion that machines won't take over. Cause I'm like, you can't even write a fucking book. <laughs> this shit doesn't make any sense at all. This dame had legs, so many legs, 16 legs to be precise. <laughs> it's like that naked gun joke. Yeah. She has legs you just could suck on for days. <laughs> the Pink Panther diamond. <laughs> I don't know how, like, tonally in this, like, the musical in the universe of this movie, we get from we whittle babies <laughs> to a murder mystery in jazz. I think it's supposed to be the alternating between this character in the book that they wrote being like a children's book author. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But why would a kid read about babies? A kid doesn't want to be a baby. That's like the whole thing. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's just because they haven't, they didn't bring that up. Like since the very beginning of the movie, I forgot that was the it original is easy premise. To, to forget, but also like it still doesn't quite make sense. Yeah. I would say they're connected because the babies talk about shooting each other, and they talk about well, people do shoot each other here. And this too also reminds me a little bit of uh, to reference the other musical we've done on this show that we've completely neglected. <laughs> I love how he stood up so he could fall down again. Do you remember that from Les Million? The no. other musical we've done that we totally forgot. I know I know Les Million, but 
the best musical we've done on the show. Yeah, so but what, far. Are, what do I remember from it? Do you remember when they were going into the bad guys' hideout? Or really, they're like good guys in that movie. They're like a Robin Hood gang, right? Yeah. And uh, there's a bunch of like mannequins and weird knickknacks. Oh, I love this. I wish all gunfights happened that way. Yeah. <laughs> Have I told you about the John Woo movie, by the way? The John Woo musical? No. Oh my god. Oh wait, god. you did mention that. Yeah, but that I I hope it's good. You should watch that. I think it's called a Last Hurrah for Chivalry. It's re- it's Is it out already? I thought you were saying it was It came coming. out in 1979. Oh, okay. I thought and then no, but you were telling me about something else. But I was just reminded of that with the gung fu combined with dancing. It's great. I John love that. Woo Gung Fu. John Woo, those movies are great. His earlier movies are just fantastic. Speaking of like, oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. But speaking of like revi- like revisions of opinions, like I've seen people who really now are champions of like Mission Impossible 2. And I just remember that movie being so terrible. I never liked any of the Mission Impossible movies. But Missing out. I'm sorry. You I do I, not like Tom Cruise though. No, I don't. Except an interview with a vampire, but you know what, Max? Uh, this does not look like the subway. Maybe it, that's what the subway looked like in the fifties before. It you did. think so? Maybe. You mean back when everyone smoked? Yes. Well, yeah. No, the ceilings were originally white. You mean yellow? No, they were originally white. They were just dyed yellow by the constant clouds of tobacco smoke. No. In reality, of course, for people who don't know this, they were became completely covered in black disgusting yeah. shit there's that famous like easter egg about like grand central where you can find the one brick they didn't replace and it's just like yeah the repulsive Gross. black <laughs> brick in the ceiling and you're like whoa also a tip for all of our listeners if you've never been to new york before and you find yourself in grand central for the first time please do not stand in the middle of the <laughs> a- a- atrium looking up at the ceiling i know there's constellations on there but everybody hates you uh, it's not that big a deal. I, I hate it. We'll you. just walk through you. Yeah. Just knock you over. It's fun. <laughs> the same moves we used before. They got them again. Mm-hmm. That's another interesting thing about this sequence as well is that it seems like... It goes on for so long. It, I it, like it, but like... It is a long part of the movie. And, and nar- that's a Minelli thing too. Like Narratively, I'm just like, this is a story in a story... Oh, this connects again to uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. With bone humping? Well, Gem Bones Cafe. I bet yeah. there's a cafe like that. Bone Daddy. But yeah, I uh, I think this this sequence and just its length and its like fact of being disconnected kind of from everything else reminds me a lot of um, an American Paris, obviously, with like the final like, what is it, like 18 minute? sequence in that movie that basically ends it where he goes into a flight of fancy after uh the woman he wants to end the movie with supposedly leaves for america or wherever the hell and uh yeah i don't know i think both an american in paris and this movie are both good but not like amazing yeah and also i just think like the way those stories are positioned kind of makes it a little bit less engrossing than it should feel for like an 18 minute thing. It's like a pure spectacle thing, but that actually kind of doesn't always seem to work in its favor. I mean, I love spectacle. I love gaudy bullshit. It's just the movie up to this point didn't seem to be on board with the idea of just like, I don't know. It had a concise story it was telling, but also I enjoy this. It's fun. And it has some of it is the best choreography and just like visual jokes in the entire movie. But I'm just like, Oh, okay. <laughs> it's suddenly this now. Yeah. And I guess, um, I guess the thing is like having something that's like pure spectacle and like non narrative is not the same as having something that's kind of, I don't know, devoid of ideas, which yeah. is not to say that this is devoid of ideas. And as we've acknowledged, there's probably a really good deep reading you could do of this scene and connect it to the, both the rest of the movie. Oh, there's the poster. Um, connect it to the rest of the movie and also perhaps even other musicals 
or different texts that it might be referencing, but also like it's not quite the same as something we might connect to like the like diversions and flights of fancy in something like Sherlock Jr., which we feel we felt like when we were watching that movie that that movie really invested a lot of like energy into those and uh, they they inform everything else that's going on in a way that's kind of interesting. And it, it seems more like interested to that movie, at least in celebrating the way in which the vaudevillian spectacle interrupts narrative than this, where it just sort of like happens, even though the movie wants to celebrate it, it seems somehow like less successful than something like Sherlock Jr. I wonder if there's a movie or something with that actual plot of like the note of the horn somehow blew up the nitroglycerin. Yeah. I don't know what kind of sense that makes. So there was a glass or the bottle with nitroglycerin in it. Oh, and it matched the pitch, the pitch or whatever broke the glass. Yes. And it exploded and killed the guy. And then. So nitroglycerin, if it's not in a glass, explodes. It's very, it's incredibly uh, (laughs) volatile, right? Volatile. So yeah. Right. But I thought that was when it was with dynamite. But if it's without Just dynamite... Just in general, dynamite is like liquid nitroglycerin. I don't know so. how this works. Okay. It, will it just explode spontaneously? It can. If okay. It's handled too roughly. I thought that was just when it was like dynamite that was like, quote unquote, sweating. That's always the thing that happens. And like just the wages of fear or whatever. Something was missing. This is Sid Charisse's best outfit in the movie. I'm going to say but she was my kind of woman. And now we're heading off into the dusky (laughs) sunset. No. And then the uh, obvious fade, the two dancing partners, the two lovers fading into the two bottles of wine that will be left unopened because he thinks it's all over. Then they surprise him. And again, this is just the movie coming full circle. As we'll see here, he's going to be under the impression that uh, nobody came to join him after the show. And then he starts singing that earlier song about him being on his own right right as he uh, was leaving the train earlier. And uh, he will finally get the reception that he was hoping for at the beginning of the film. Not from the public, but the other people he was working with. And his character will be complete. Without ever having changed anything about himself, but merely everyone else around him will have recognized how amazing he really is. All because he didn't do the artistic, ambitious thing. Maybe it sounds like we're being too hard in this movie. No, I just think it kind of... I don't think we've been hard on it at all. Yeah. I just still think it's very good. It's just like... There's a few things that are just like... Eh, eh, eh. We can't... Our two modes can't be shitting on a movie and sucking its dick. We need to be able to do a little bit of both. Yeah, that's true. Although that's disgusting to think about. Not, don't kink shame. <laughs> Art <laughs> reviewing yeah. style. We get our first reprise, and then we're going to get another reprise of That's Entertainment a little bit from now. How do you feel about the pacing of this movie? Um, I think it's very concise for most of it. Yeah. It's just after the first musical flops, it kind of goes off the rails for a little bit. Um it's fun, but it's still they have like, to recover, yeah. like reset. But also it's definitely like, it's interesting watching it again this week. And also this time with the volume on low, because that's also a very interesting thing when you're watching musicals, I think is really to watch them without the music, but also like 
it it feels somehow both like it slows down and then remains still very much like on the rails, you know, because really the second half of the movie is not a long period of time after the like the first show flops to the end of the movie. Not a very long period of time in the movie, but it yeah. feels longer because it's now just like digression upon digression upon digression until we get to the girl hunt sequence. Yeah. Right. And then the show is over and then, you know, we have the, the end of the movie, which again, this is just putting a cap on everything that we've said. I would have loved if she like, cause she turned the, the cast. Thank you to Tony <clears throat> into her romantic confession. I would yeah. have loved if someone like this, a guy next to him was like, I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't like you that much, Tony, but thanks for the paycheck. But you know, what's interesting too, um, about you mentioning that and something you brought up too earlier about feeling like Sid Charisse and Fred Astaire don't get enough scenes alone together is yeah. how in this type of Hollywood musical, there's this weird emphasis on like romance and like the idea of the marriage plot being sort of, sort of like a communal thing. Yeah. Which is very weird. And also is something discussed by some of the essays in the book that I'm going to be um, mentioning in the show notes, which is really good book on the musical genre it's called genre colon the musical edited edited by rick altman and the essays in this volume are pretty fantastic as just like a general critical introduction to the musical but there are essays that discuss that too which again i think also informs the folk quality of it where it's supposed to arise out of like this community of people not out of some like grand artistic scheme, but just come out of like their practices and habits out of spontaneity and like real life. Right. So then the marriage plot too becomes like this communal celebration thing where they, as they, I don't know, come together in marriage. So too does the community come together in a song and dance, you know? Yeah. So it kind of just feels that way. So I don't know. That was bandwagon. It has been bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't really know what else to say about it other than to, I don't know, revisit it at some point with the intertextual references. But no, I don't know. It's a good movie. I don't enjoy it like immensely. (laughs) The end. I don't know. I think there's a lot of different things to talk about with this movie. It's strange uh, and it's not as straightforward as like you, you would assume if somebody told you the basic gist of the movie. Yeah. Honestly, I'm glad we did it, but also it is kind of like a challenging first type of musical to do for the MGM musicals, but also I don't like it so much that I would rather do it instead of other ones. So if we began with something else, I don't know how long it would take to get to this one. That's true. But I'm happy that we were making leeway into musicals so we can do more, especially ones that I'm very passionate about. Yeah, we are going to be able to do more of those uh, classic MGM ones. We could branch out into the earlier Fred Astaire ones, or we could do, uh, definitely we're going to do the Jacques Demy ones. So there's a lot of different directions to go in terms of musicals. And uh, yeah, so do you have anything else to say, Max? Nah, no, I'm bad at this, but what are you going to do? That's right. entertainment. <laughs> well, if you want to listen to more of our not entertaining commentary tracks, you can hey. find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or find our episodes on Spotify, iTunes, or Stitcher. And uh, yeah, that's it. Goodbye, everyone.